Hello, seekers uh, uh, after Christ. Good to come to you again. This is Romal Simeon, and the book is Love Letters from Your Father. We're saying from the beginning that not only is Jesus is the love letter from the Father, but every chapter of Scripture is a love letter from the Father. But Jesus is that love letter that the Father sent to us in actual human form. So we can understand his teachings. Well, we study those, but we can understand from his modeling of everything that he did. So as we come into the chapters of love letters, the books of John, in the Bible, the, in the Gospel of John, well, we can see the continuity of what the Lord did as he came into the world and to his public life. It's a narration of his public life. And he had come to John the Baptist, the precursor. We talked about that. And we have to say that John, when he identified Jesus, and he said the Messiah was coming, he used a very special term. He didn't call him the king of the Jews. He didn't call him the son of David. He called him the Lamb of God. That could be somewhat confusing. And we go by the, the Pharisees came and wanted to know his identity and who they was talking about. And they had said the Lamb of God. This is interesting because in the Jewish tradition, in the law of Moses, the different sacrifices, it's talking about a sacrificial lamb. It's talking about the Seder. It's talking about the time of Passover where someone is going to come like an angel of death and give keep life to those who are with the Lord and death to die, all that is against the Lord. To liber, liberate persons. To take them out of captivity. And that's very interesting too because what are the names that were given to Jesus Christ before uh, he was actually born? It says, the angel said to Mary, Emmanuel, he will be called Emmanuel, God among us. And then when he was circumcised, he was given the name Yeshua, Jesus, the Savior, the one who liberates. So Christ didn't give his full identity in the beginning of his public life. He had to prove and show his identity. We know how he did it, by his miracles, by speaking the word of God, by showing that he was the prophet of God, that he was fulfilling the prophecies. So he fulfilled one prophecy after another. That's how he did it. But let's start here from uh, connecting chapter one of John's love letters in the gospel to chapter two. We know what chapter two is, it's Cana, the marriage of Cana, the marriage and wedding feast of Cana. But let's connect the two. Jesus was baptized at Jericho with John the Baptist, by John the Baptist. Then two of the followers of John the Baptist began to follow Jesus and followed after him and asked him where he lived and to con uh, connect to him. And he said, come and see. But now we are looking at Jesus in North Galilee, around Capernaum or Bethsaida in the North Galilee. And there he connects to the other persons to himself. So he begins his apostolate 
he begins his whole ministry by getting disciples, by connecting persons to himself. In the Old Testament, they call these the sons of the prophets. A yeshiva, a school of learning. We say that he began to get persons about him. So when we come to uh, Cana, we find out that he has six followers, six persons that he has chosen. Remember what the Lord says. I have chosen you. You did not choose me. He comes out and he chooses us. He chooses those that are to be eventually shepherds of him. In fact, that's what these disciples of the prophets also were called because the prophets were also called shepherds. They were, they shepherded people like lambs. So there's a connection there. The shepherd is declared by John the Baptist as being the lamb of God. So this is interesting because he fulfills say, every prophecy and the prophecies not only talked about him as being the king of David, the conqueror, the foul, that all nations will come to his feet, but it also talked about the suffering servant, especially in Isaiah the prophet, the suffering servant. How could these things be put together? We see that in the Gospels, how it is put together, how Jesus put it together, and how he expressed and followed every nuance of all the different prophecies that even seemed conflicting. It seemed that they were even contradictory. How could the person who be everlasting and king of Israel, king of the Jews, and the son, the son of David also be Lord and master, be eternal, all these things are said and yet die. So we have to make the connection. Well, so Jesus began to get his disciples who were going to co-shepherd with him. But this isn't the co-shepherding. This is a, a three-year apprenticeship. <laughs> he, the sons of the prophets were the apprentices. He selected them from he didn't have any disciples yet, but they would be the leaders of these disciples. They would be the, the close, the brotherhood, the school of Jesus, the direct school of Jesus that he would establish his kingdom on their witnesses. So let us say that why Jesus then later when we uh, do the scriptures, he was, See that he, he says many things to the Pharisees and his teachings and all. And he says, you know, I came to liberate you, to re, re, uh, remove your captivity. And this could be, again, for, this we could say from the beginning, what was he talking about? Well, what was the situation in Israel at this time? Uh, I won't go into all the details, but it was, first of all, a time of relative world peace, where that we remember when he was uh, born, that they had to go, uh, the family had to go, and Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem in order to register. It was a time of peace when they were taking the censorship. The Roman Empire had control over all the areas. But what was the situation in Israel itself? Well, the Romans were in political control, but according to the law of Moses, God was in control. And then he had kings that were uh, subject to the law of God with the prophecies of the Old Testament had many problems with them. But you had David, and then you had also the high priest. So you had a religious 
headship and you had a political headship. Then you had the people, then you had the law, you had the Torah, you had the Ten Commandments, you had God. This could be a little bit confusing, but what was the situation at the time of Jesus? The situation was that the Romans had the political control, but they also divided the territories, which was usual with Romans in their uh, empire. They allowed local kings to rule under their direction. They didn't just wipe everything out. And that is how they had like, in a certain way, it was like a confederation. But in Israel, it was this. They controlled all political leaders. And Israel was divided into four groups. The tetrarchs, that's what it means, four, tetrarch. And so when we talk about, we know about the two all the time, uh, mainly because you had the uh, tetrarchy of Ju Judah, and you had which the Roman governor ruled himself from the Roman city of uh, the uh, Marit uh, Caesarea Maritima, and then you had the Tetrarch of Galilee, which the son of Herod the Great was ruler. So those things come always into our uh, discussion of the New Testament in regard to the Gospel of John. So, but who were, were they? A pagan ruler? who controlled the priesthood. The priests were not completely independent. They had to be assigned and they bid for the high priest's vestments every year. And here we have two high priests at the time of Jesus. You have the one of imposed by, uh, by uh, the uh, ruler, by the governor, and that was Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee. Now, I'm sorry, not the, <laughs> the high priest. I'm going to mixing rulers with high priests. The high priest was Caiaphas. And, but you had two high priests. Annas was the one, legitimate one who did not go into the bidding. So Annas was the one that the religious Jews recognized and the Caiaphas was the one actually with the control. Then you had uh, the ruler of Galilee and he was not exactly a, uh, a religious man and uh, he murdered uh, John the Baptist and he was called by Jesus the fox and Jesus avoided him. Now, uh, what there, there were, so you had rival rulers who d did not always get along with each other. And religiously, you had persons who were following different ways of interpreting the law. You had the Sadducees who did not believe in immortality. They were the liberals. You had the Pharisees who were very conservative, who followed the law to the nth degree with all kinds of rules and regulations. They're, they were very also ritualistic. And they were also like the uh, religious police. They were always going around watching and, and seeing if everybody was following the rules. And uh, they're the ones that came down to John the Baptist and asked him, are you the Messiah? No, I'm not the Messiah. And do you know who he is? I don't know who he is yet. But when uh, 
John the Baptist saw Jesus walking by and he says, there is the Lamb of God who's inspired by the Holy Spirit to declare that that was the Lamb of God. And that was the Son of Mary. So, you see, there was, it was very confusing and you'll see it as you go in through the love letters of Jesus in the actual narration, historical narration. Now, were the Jews suppressed? Well, you could see. They believed they were free to follow the law of Moses, following the Torah, but there's a conflict there. They're following other leaders and collaborating with them and even uh, sometimes compromising with them. So that when, for instance, when the Pharisees went to Jesus and said, this coin, should we give a, a tribute to Caesar? And Jesus said, well, give me the coin. And the coin is, whose picture is it on it? Caesar's picture. Then give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. In other words, you're compromising with Caesar. Why do you ask me what you're doing? Are you total Jews? Are you totally following the Ten Commandments? And he corrected them many times on this. But let's get back then to the identity. Jesus then had to give self-identity to himself. Who, how was he? Uh, it was very confusing sometimes to understand. And he had to show that he was truly the Son of God, and that he had divine um, attributes in himself. Now, the, uh, say the apostles were then in apprenticeship. They were there to recognize the, and listen to Jesus, to recognize him. And he had to show them that he, his divinity and identify to him. And that's the first thing we have here in the, in the Kena experience. He gathered, he gathered these uh, disciples. They were not yet apostles. They were not being sent out. They were disciples. They were being learners. They were being students. And he was beginning to teach them. Right now, in this chapter, uh, the first chapter of, uh, of John, he gathers six, six of these disciples, and that is Andrew, John, and the brother of Andrew, Peter, the brother of John, James, and then Philip and Nathaniel. So with these three now, he is in North Galilee, and he wants to go to Jerusalem, quite a distance from north of Israel to the south, or at least the middle. And he is going to journey there and he is going to gather other disciples. He wants 12 disciples. And Yeshiva are 12. This is typical in the, uh, among the Jews because of the 12 tribes of Israel. He's restoring the 12 leaders of the 12 sections and 12 divisions of the sons of Jacob. And he says he, they will sit in the thrones and judge Israel. They will judge as co-judges with Jesus when he comes into his glory. But they are to work with him. They are to help him to establish and be the physical establishment of the kingdom of God, which is his church or clan or his covenant on earth, the testament of Jesus on earth. So now we have him going from northern Galilee towards Jerusalem. And on the way, he stops at Nazareth, the place of his childhood. Well, of not a childhood until he was 30 years old. And there is his mother, who is a widow, because jo Joseph has died, apparently. And 
there's an interesting thing. She greets them and gives hospitality to the six followers of Jesus and happy to see him on his way to his, uh, and she's not going to interfere with his public life. That's supposed to begin, he intends to begin it in Jerusalem at the temple, at his father's house, the temple, just like he said when he was 12 years old. I am at my father's house. And that's where he was going to begin it. But it happens, a relative of Jesus, Mary, is about to be married. <laughs> this is a big celebration. This is something important. She's supposed to be there. She's supposed to be helping with it. It's a clan. They all work together. And Mary has to go there. Who's Jesus now in his human position? His human position, he, he is the heir or his legacy of Joseph. And therefore, he has to represent the family. He should represent the family. And so this sounds like an, an interference, a, a sidestep. And he's got, he's got six disciples with him. And he still intends to get six more. But Mary is in a problem. She has to go there. She has to be part of it. She has, we, she probably had to be very involved because that's the way they were. When they, and were married uh, in Israel with the, the system they had, you had to have, you invited all of your synagogue. You invited all the people who could come. And when the marriage was, wasn't just, it was a question of the ceremony where you actually were going to live with that spouse and you were under the, uh, under the uh, blank and that, that the, the awning or whatever it is, <laughs> forget the word right now, <laughs> but uh, you, uh, you're, and you make your, take your vows and then the, uh, the husband takes you home and you have the festival. Well, these festivals were something really big. They always were big. No matter how poor you were and all that, they were big. Your synagogue was invited. The town was invited. Everybody came. It was a big, aff big affair, the biggest affair you'd have in your life. The most important affair that people had in their lives. And so, Mary had went to Cana, very close by to Nazareth. And Jesus decided to go with her because he was the head of the family. He goes with her. It's a distraction, but he accommodates his mother and her need at the time. So it just shows that Mary, if you look at it now, we said that faith was having the eyes of Jesus. You're not blind. We, they say blind faith but to play when you have the eyes of Jesus. You're really blind when you have human eyes because human eyes always look at things in a human way. But to look at a thing divine way, Jesus was the light. And to have the light of his eyes and your eyes, you could see well course, get rid of the beam that's in your eyes. John the Baptist took care of that, and Jesus takes care of that too. That's the preparation. So now, Jesus goes to Cana with his disciples, and it's a big, big affair. Now, a wedding feast, the word uh, that they used in the scriptures was mestida. Masita means a wine festival. It's not that everybody got drunk there or they were inebriated and ended up under the table. But it was that wine was a symbol of life. 
Wine was a symbol of blood. We have the same thing in our liturgy. The same thing with the Eucharist. Bread and wine. Food or food, and that's what bread. Bread really means food. The general term for food. And wine, blood. So the symbol is very clear that this is a life-giving event. This is when couples almost are creational because they begin to have families and to bring life into the world. So you see how complicated it is. This was all the understanding of the Jews. You have to know the background, the Jewish background of the scriptures to understand the love letters. And so what does this mean then? Jesus calls there. He's participating, assisting his mother, but participating in the marriage festival. He's a recipient. But, you know, Jesus didn't come into this world to be recipient of things. And everywhere he went, he became the main actor. And this was his identity. As a son of God, as the, the, in his human nature, he had to join together his divinity with his humanity. And this is part very clearly of his humanity, then his divinity is expressed very clearly in the wedding feast of Cana, the second chapter of John's Gospel. Now, in this, there are many things that people do not know about these wedding feasts. People had to come with the Jewish custom. You had to be get your feet cleaned. You had to be wash your feet. You had to when you had at the at the table. You had to wash your hands, hands all to the elbow, uh, uh, elbow. It was a ritual. Water was very much needed, and that is why you have the six earthen jars. Not just jars; they were almost like, like small barrels. And we could describe then how much wine there was. And the mastida wasn't just a day, not just a few hours. It, went, it could go on as much as eight days. And if it went on for this specific day and not that long because they didn't have enough wine, then it would be the honeymoon. The couples would go to their house the man was expected to be a have a household where he could take his bride. And then people could visit all for eight days to this to persons that didn't attend the actual specific wedding. They would come to this wedding feast. So wine was a great necessity to have a good quantity of wine so that you could give hospitality and people could celebrate with you. This was a very important day. It wasn't just that they would be embarrassed. It was more than embarrassment. It was something that they could not fulfill the custom of the time and the traditions and do what was expected. So when they were at the fest festival, Mary, who is in the section of the women. The women and the men did not actually mix in. The men were with the men, the women were with the women, and Jesus was with the men. And Mary could hear, and rumors go around, you know, women love, hear rumors and watch very much. They're always analyzing and looking at the situation and seeing what someone puts a word out that the wine is giving out. These people apparently were not rich. The wine was giving out. They were, had made toasts and everything and had the best wine was being given at the beginning of the banquet. And who knows how, how long it was going on. And the wine was giving out. 
And Mary heard it. And she was related. She was part of the clan. She was part of her extended family. And she was concerned, very concerned. Yes, her son was not going to stay there long. He was not going to stay there for the honeymoon. He was going to go to Jerusalem and get his disciples as he had planned. But the wine was giving out. And this would be a catastrophe. Mary, very sensitive, very compassionate. And what to do? Nobody knew what to do. The word was going around. What could they do? Could they go and purchase wine? Maybe they could, didn't have enough to, to purchase. Maybe everybody had to share to dig into, dig into whatever resources they had to get wine. And if, it, if there was an abrupt change, if there was constant, be consternation, a disaster, Mary saw it ha about to happen. And that's it. Mary was very observant. Mary and her ministry with the Lord Jesus, she is the one who all cares about what's happening to all people around. And she, one thing that she knew, she knew her son. She knew who he was. She knew that he was divine. You know, uh, sometimes I hear this, there's a hymn that people sing and they say, did you know Mary? Did you know Mary that your son was going to walk on water? Did you know Mary that your son was going to, going to uh, uh, turn water into wine? Did you know Mary that your son was going to do this or that? Well, <laughs> that's a hymn I don't like. <laughs> I can't stand that hymn. It's not beautiful music. They're attempting beautiful words. But if anyone knew who Jesus was and he didn't have to prove his identity to, was Mary. Mary had it from the beginning knew what it was. She was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. The angel Gabriel told her who she was. That she would be the, the Messiah's mother. Who would be the son of God. There was no doubt in her mind who Jesus was. So, you know, when does God work miracles? You read in your sacred literature. When you can't do it, when you have faith, she had every qualification that Jesus could do something. She wasn't going to tell him what to do. You don't have to tell God what to do when you got a problem. He knows what the problem is. Jesus says that when he talks about prayer, he knows what your need is. When you to pray, you really have to pray because you are making a connection, because you're disconnected to God. God is always connected to you. He knows everything about you. He always knows every need that you have. And he knows when a need is not a want. He knows when you, you say, I want this, I want that, but it's not a need. You have, we'll come to that later. Needs are things that are necessary, that you're inhuman if you don't have it. It's against your human nature that God established for you. And what do we need most of all in our life? We need God. So Mary sees this, and she sees a person of action. She doesn't sit there and say, oh, twiddle her thumbs. What do we do? What do we do? What can I do? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come to you and say, uh, uh, look, uh, uh, sorry what's happening and I uh, hope you don't mind. And uh, it won't be as bad, you know. Uh, look at uh, uh, other realities, but there's the wine is going to give out and your banquet and your festival. It's a, a festival more than a banquet. No, she doesn't do that. Mary takes initiative. 
She knows what to do. She knows who to talk to. She knows how to talk to him without demanding, simply by exposing to him. He's there with these disciples. He's there with the other men. And she calls him over, gets to, get to call him, tells the waitress, I want to talk to my son. What is it? The wine is giving out. You know the situation. Don't have to explain it to Jesus. But mother, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. It's not my time. Okay, son. The Jewish mother. <laughs> Don't have to say anything else. I wouldn't express it this way, but it's they kind of lay guilt on you. <laughs> you can't lay guilt on Jesus. He was sinless, and he knew the situation. And he immediately, immediately, okay, Mark, everything will be taken care of. I can handle it. But what about the people there? What about the waiters? What about the, the ones who are assisting and serving the wine? What about all the people who are serving? Mary goes to them and says, look, the wine is giving out. You're all in a dither. You're all worried about it. But my son's going to take care of it. How? Don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. Just do whatever he tells you. She goes back and sits down. Jesus goes, takes over. He takes over. Yeah. The mother, Mary warns us about things, but Jesus always takes over. Graces are given. Mary can be the channel, but Jesus is the grace. He's the gift to us. He's the power. The Holy Spirit is the power. And he tells him what to do. You know the story? You know the story very well. Go. There are these jars of water. People have been using them for the festival, for washing feet and everything like that, for the cooking, for whatever was necessary. Fill the jars. Fill them to the overflowing with water. Oh, no, they scurry together. They don't know what, what the heck they're doing. Just taking orders. Just orders. Just do it. Follow orders. Don't analyze. Don't ask questions. Just do it. That's what witnessing is. We witness for Jesus. We're witnessing. Just do it. Go. Teach all. The things that I have commanded you, baptizing them. That was his last command to all of us. Just do it. What? This, this I don't know how to do it. I don't know uh, who to reach or what to do. Go and do it. Learn from Jesus who teaches everyone by his model. And this is one of the models. Cana is a model for us to witness. So, he takes the servants and makes them serve. Fill, the, fill it with water. With water. What is he doing? We're hearing that there's no wine. We're hearing that it's got, the wine is going to be taken out. It's going to uh, dry out. It's going to be a disaster. And he tells us to go and fill the jars. They fill it with water. Here is enough water in there to last for a whole week. And he says, without telling them what he's doing, without telling them they have to simply 
go on faith. When you go on faith, you don't ask questions. You just do it. He says, now, what are we going to do? Take some of the wine out. Take some samples of it and bring it to the chief steward. Chief steward decides the quality of the wine. He decides what the wine is. And he knows that it's becoming less and less. And there's going to be a disaster. They take it out and he's, wow. <laughs> if this is water, <laughs> the chief steward who's going to test everything, who's going to sip it and and find out what it is or what it to serve it. And we're going to serve it? We can't serve it unless the chief steward says to serve it. They go and give it to the chief steward. He tastes it. They didn't tell him where it came from. He didn't know what Jesus was doing in the background. He just saw him over there doing things and commanding, maybe he was worried about it, commanding the servants. But it wasn't his duty to command the servants. It was his duty to check the wine list. And so he tastes it. He says, what is this? This isn't the wine that they gave me to hand out for the for the toasts. This is this is not even the secondary wines that could be used when all the good wines are gone. This is the best. This is premium. Super. Never tasted anything like this. And he's not sure where it came from. And he goes over to the The master, he says, where did this come from? Did you keep a reserve of it? Or did people bring it? What did they do? Jesus, serve it. Serve it out to the people. Serve it out. Barrels of water turned into wine. Persons who are doing the serving work, the simple carrying out orders, didn't know what was going on. When the apostles, when the who are now only disciples, got their first lesson, if he says he'll do it, he does it. If he says he can do it, it's guaranteed. And now they begin to understand. It wasn't just a promise of a Messiah. It wasn't just John the Baptist who said he was the son of God, who said he was the lamb of God. Whatever was going to come, they didn't know. When, when P, Peter and the apostles were taught, the, those disciples, first disciples were taught, put your nets down. I'll make you fishers of men. They had no idea what was going to happen to them. They only believed. They had faith. And with faith, they weren't perf perfect in themselves and even in their faith. They hesitated. They made different judgments. But now, they were on the way. They were on the right road. They were with Jesus. Sometimes Jesus had to carry them. Sometimes he had to pull them. Sometimes he had to warn them. But as long as they followed Jesus, they could see what was happening. They would see that he was had all of these titles because the titles are not enough to describe the Son of God, the light of the world. Emmanuel, God with us. Not just a symbol of God, 
but God himself. They can talk to God through him. They can talk to God with him. So even at the Last Supper, Jesus can say to Philip, who was one of these six disciples, Philip, you've seen me. Don't you realize that you've seen the Father? You've seen the Father for three years. And don't say now in, in a human way, and be in a forgetful way. When you prove, it will be proved to you. If you see me, you see the Father. Well, at the wedding feast of Cana, the people saw Jesus as Mary already knew him and saw him with the eyes of Jesus, with faith, when the angel Gabriel came to her. When she became, that instant, the mother of God. God bless you.